Okay, quick disclaimer before we get started. The Blockmates podcast is for entertainment and informational purposes only and does not constitute financial advice. The information and opinions expressed on the podcast are those of the hosts and guests and do not necessarily reflect the views of Blockmates or its affiliates. Listeners are encouraged to do their own research and consult with a financial advisor before making any investment decisions. Blockmates and its affiliates are not liable for any losses or damages incurred as a result of the reliance on the information or opinions expressed on this podcast. All right, welcome back, everyone. Been a, been away for a week. Been on the eventful stag do. Not too many casualties. Alex has broke his foot. That's about <laughs> about the only thing bad that happened. So <laughs> made it back in one piece. <laughs> but yeah, we uh, we tried to get this one in before I went away. But um, and I've been really looking forward to it. And this is kind of a project that kind of is all encompassing of the stuff that we really like to cover on on across all our content articles and stuff like that. So. Um, we've got the co-founder of Unison on here today. So, Manish, how's it going? How are you doing, sir? Apologies, it took so long to get you on, but um, <laughs> finally glad to have you here. No, man, like happy, happy to be here and it's going great. So just busy building in the last like couple of weeks. I think we were a bit busy, but yeah, going great. Love to hear it, love to hear it. Yeah, I mean, when things say uh, kind of like vault strategies and layer zero all in like one, I'm just like my ears prick up because <laughs> we're a bit like of a kind of omni chain maxis here. I mean, we've invested in tapioca, um, well, for a number of reasons, but the whole idea of just completely abstracting away chains and for people, it's it's something that we think is a bit crazy when people get maximalist over one specific destination or one specific chain. So, um, yeah, really happy to kind of get into this and just want to kind of show off what you guys are building. But um, I'd love to just kind of set the scene on like how you found yourself getting into this space, just kind of give a bit of background on like the route that you've taken to kind of where you are now effectively. Yeah, so me personally, I've been in the space since like, I think late 2016, uh, second year of college. And I was just interested, uh, just I think like that's when things started popping, popping up a bit and was just learning about blockchains. Uh, I think Bitcoin was the first one. And then I was, I think, like, it's a funny story. I was in class one day, and ETH went from $8 to $12 a day. So, so that obviously grabbed my attention. And then of the 2017 uh, bull market, which was, like, awesome. And then the 2018-19 were obviously very, very bad. Uh, but, yeah, back then, I was just, like, uh, investing my own money in. And, and that was basically it. I was studying computer science. So I was also interested in the tech aspect of it. Uh, but in October of 2021, that's when we started thinking about, like, building on, like, like doing, uh, going on the building side of things rather than just investing. And that's when uh, I think, like, that was around the time when I met my co-founder also. So we were just discussing some ideas. She was from the traditional finance background. And so initially we thought of doing something with fixed rate, but found out that the, the uh, audience in DeFi is like very different from traditional finance, right? So mm-hmm. it's a bunch of DGENs and also like some really like smart advanced players, but but it's very different from traditional finance. Right? So fixed rate till now, it's not it's not so big. So I think it was like March, March of 2022 when we brainstormed idea about like having a protocol which does cross-chain yield. And initially our focus was, so one of the person I was talking to, he was from the Cosmos ecosystem. So initially our focus was to do it on Cosmos. So we were figuring out like how to kind of like do it on Cosmos because there are so many chains and, and yield avenues there also. But we found out that it was not possible because IBC wasn't, wasn't there yet. So then we, I think around that time, uh, Layer 0 and XLR was also like being launched. Then we, we looked into Layer 0. We looked into the same idea of cross-chain yield aggregation, and then we started building using layer zero. Now, obviously, it was EVM; it was supporting EVM, so we had to let go of Cosmos back then. Uh, and yeah, so so we started from there, right? So so we started looking at layer zero, started uh, kind of like seeing like how exactly would the product look, how exactly should the architecture look, so it's like uh, the most efficient, the most scalable yield aggregator. So so yeah, that's that's our starting. Nice. What was the um for someone who's got the technical know-how of like a six-year-old? What was the shift over from? Is is Cosmos based on Rust? And what was like the kind of shift over there when you were kind of picking up EVM? Mm-hmm. So so uh, the good thing was that it uh, yeah. So as you said, right, it's based on Rust. 
the good thing was that we never actually started building on cosmos so we were looking at it mm. uh, because like uh, none of our team members were really good with like rust i think there was one one other engineer that was like uh, we hired from a cosmos ecosystem protocol uh, he was good with rust but we never kind of made progress there we looked at layer 0 and i think like the developer friendliness of layer 0 was like pretty insane so we were also looking at xlr so there are some pros and cons of using both right so so we're looking at like multiple of those things and evm was where we had done like some i would say like hobby programming also so i think like it was like much easier to to kind of start building on evms yeah yeah that makes a lot of sense yeah i'm starting to see a little bit more about axlar come on online um what what was it about layer zero that you know give you guys the definite green light to go on build using that infrastructure and he's, I don't even think we've scratched the surface on projects that are going to build on it yet. I think there's going to be a huge wave. Um but like what was it that you you guys were like yeah this is this is the one this is where we're going to kind of focus all our attention. Mm-hmm. Uh so one thing was like the developer friendliness of it right so we were looking at like both the solutions and we wanted something uh, where the liquidity layer and the messaging layer was tightly knit. because when we are doing some swap from one chain to other chain right so let's say you are depositing on on ethereum but the strategy is living on on polygon right so when that swap mm-hmm. happens we wanted to perform some logic and at that time squid router wasn't launched uh, launched on xlr right so we wanted something uh, where where uh, as i said right the liquidity layer and and the messaging layer was tightly knit and that was that was what like stargate was right so in stargate when you make a swap from one chain to other chain you can also send a message so you can do the same with uh, with xlr but using purely xlr you you have to deal with like xlr assets and then we had to take care about converting those xlr assets to native assets on the other chain so that was like the concern there uh, but yeah and also the other thing was the uh, the layer 0 team was like very supportive so we had a few calls with prayan and ryan from layer 0 in terms of like how to nail the architecture like what would make the most sense in terms of doing cross chain identification because obviously it was mentioned in the white paper right there are there were like four things that were mentioned and we focused on the yield aggregation side because i think as a pro- as a product yield aggregation is a pretty simple one and also it can onboard a lot of users like like i won't say lazy but like a lot of users who want to kind of streamline uh, the way to kind of earn earn like passive income they can do that with yield aggregation and the ux is pretty simple you just make a deposit and you let the protocol work and earn yield for you So so yeah that was the reasoning behind layer zero. Nice. Yeah so I kind of think you've set the scene really well there. So can you give us a give us a high level maybe from for someone who's just coming into the space about what Unison is and then um I want to get into the nitty gritty about it as well. So I'd love to hear like a high level for someone who maybe they're just coming on chain for the first time um and like what's what's the What does the user journey look like, and what does the what does the value proposition look like for them using Unison? Mm-hmm. Uh, so I won't say like it's an yield aggregator. I would say like I would I would like uh, term it in a much slim, simpler way. You deposit some assets, and what we do is we write strategies so that your assets can increase over time, right? And uh, all those things are automated once you make a deposit, right? So and that's what basically yield aggregation is. We 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 find strategies on different chains on different protocols. We see we uh, we basically do our due diligence on where would the strategy fit, right? And if it's like fit for us to kind of deploy the assets there, and then we integrate it into our bot. And that way the user just have to make a single deposit and he can earn yield from all the chains that layer zero supports or any cross chain messaging protocol supports. So in terms of the user journey, it's like very simple, right? So uh, we allow deposits from all the chains that Layer Zero supports. So you can be on Optimism, you can be on Ethereum, Polygon, etc., and you can make a deposit on Unison. What happens with the deposit is that it is then deployed to a vault. Now, vault, we have. Uh, it was our decision to make the vault on a single chain because I think uh, it is like a bit complex to implement that, but uh, it has like a lot of benefits. right so in terms of like reporting how the strategies are performing and 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 what the pnl of the single vault does it becomes much easier and also minting and burning of vault tokens so once a user makes a deposit it goes into a vault on arbitrum and from there that vault has strategies which are integrated and the strategies are cross chain now to give like a really good example where it makes the most sense uh, 
to take an example of something like Aave or Curve, which are like really huge multi-chain protocols where you can generate yield by supplying USDC or whatever token you want to the Aave protocol. The way Unison does it is we look at, uh, so we look at like all the chains, all the pools uh, available where you could supply USDC on Aave and we choose the best, uh, best chain that is there. Now current crop of yield aggregators so to take an example of something like Yarn Finance or BP Finance, and they're using their curve strategies, right? So for Dai, let's say they want to earn some yield on Dai. They look at all the pools that are available on, on Curve, and then uh, all the pools in a single network, though, right? And uh, available on Curve, and then they deposit and, and start earning yield. Now we take it like a one step further. We look at all the pools on all the chains. Available. So from there, the yield start, uh, the, the strategy starts generating yield. And then it is again like uh, compounded every week, and and that's mainly it, right? So so we can take assets from any chain, we can write a strategy on any chain. So even though new newer chains are launches, which are which are which are launching, right? So so the newer L twos and all those things, we can be there on day one. As soon as layer zero starts supporting those chains, we can look for strategies there, and uh, also to to give some context about around the vault itself. Right, so we've got two vaults for each asset, and uh, those vaults, uh, the category is basically based on the amount of risk the user wants to take. Our senior vaults are like much more conservative, and we look at protocols which have stood the test of time, the Aves and curves of DeFi, and then we deploy majority of the assets there. And let's say 10 to 15 percent are deployed to a smaller protocol where the, where the yield is a little higher, but it balances it out. With the junior vault, we take uh, we do like uh, more experimentation that than we can do uh, with the senior. Vault. So bulk of the assets there are deposited into newer protocols, like not so new but newer protocols, something like Velodrome and and so on. And also we uh, have some strategies where we utilize the yield and put it into options for option straddles like Dopex and and so on. So that's where we are experimenting with. And the user can choose each of these vaults where he wants to like. Depending on what risk he wants to take, he can do it. And uh, yeah, so so that's that's it on the yield aggregation part. And then we obviously also have a, a product for for the DAOs to manage their uh, treasury. And yeah, can talk about that later. Yeah, for sure. So how how much of a decision does the end user need to make then? So let's say we use like the most basic example of USDC. Um, and you touched upon there's a lot of emerging L2s. Let's say there's a new L2 that's come online, or even if we use the example of Optimism running a like an OP emissions campaign for like Curve, for example. If I was depositing into the vault, do I need to kind of direct the USDC towards Optimism because that's paying out the highest amount of emissions? Or does like the back end just completely deal with that? It's just gonna find you the best the best yield for your specific asset on any specific chain, or do I have to kind of direct it towards a specific chain if I'm the user? So yeah, everything is like completely automated. So we abstract away the away the bridging part. The user doesn't have to bridge from one chain to another. He can be coming from Arbitrum and earn the yield on optimism, right? So all those things are like completely automated on which chain to go to. The only control that we as Unison has is writing strategies, which uh, later on we are going to open up for other people also to write strategies. But initially we write the strategies and we integrate into the vault. Now the allocation, the bridging of assets and everything is taken care by the vault itself. So the user, all the user has to do is make a deposit in any of the vaults that we choose, which are junior and senior, doesn't matter the chain that he's coming from, and the assets will start working for him. Mm -hmm. So say if I was depositing like ETH or staked ETH over the course of like 12 months, um, is using the protocol directly seeking out the best opportunity at that specific, at any one given time? So maybe months one to three, I don't know, Lido are running a strong campaign on Arbitrum and they're incentivizing with LDO and then maybe months three to six they've shifted and maybe they're looking at base to incentivize more heavily with wrap stakes, um, even things like that. Is the vault just continually managing where the yield is kind of directing from? Like the user just sets and forgets, don't have to like kind of withdraw and then redeposit to a vault. Like how, how does that work? Yeah, so that's a great question, right? So so in terms of uh, at uh, what 
time does the wall kind of looks into newer strategies and deposits currently we are looking at like one week time frame right so every week the wall goes through all the strategies there are and see what is the change in the apr and what is the change in the tvl of those specific strategies and make decision uh, so let's say that lido started an emissions program on optimism or or maybe on eth itself right and 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 to to kind of take it further let's say there is an emission program from optimism and lido on both both of the platforms right so so at the end of the week we'll see okay this is what is happening on optimism and the state breath the best position is to do that right now and the vault will automatically direct because it will just look through numbers right so the numbers there would be there is like inherent yield in the st eth asset right and then there is extra lido rewards rewards and extra op rewards now add it up and what you are getting so let's say directly depositing on lido you you were getting like 4.5% or 5% with op rewards and everything it's giving 7% so that's where the assets would be deployed there is some uh, there are some uh, more things that we look at so that uh, we don't kind of end up in a single wall right so majority of assets don't end up in a single wall we give some weightage to those strategies right so this is the maximum that this strategy should take this is the maximum that sh- this strategy should take so that way it's kind of like diversified if one protocol goes down it's a big problem yeah. right? so so that way we are diversifying too and is there is there a way that you guys think about like kind of forecasting cuz let's say it gets to the end of that weekly epoch if you want to call it that um and maybe there's a great there's a great if we use your example of op incentives and lido incentives on optimism is there a way of forecasting whether that can be sustained? Maybe you've the uh, your algorithms picked it up, or you guys have picked it up early, and there isn't a lot of TVL and like I don't know APRs are in like the hundreds. But I, I suppose there's no way of kind of forecasting how many people are going to jump on that. Um, obviously, your stake weight on that specific pool gets diluted. But then again, I suppose at the end of the week, then you can just kind of reassess. But is is there a way that you guys kind of think about forecasting? Will this yield be sustained? Um, because I'd like to know that personally as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so currently, as you said, right? So we, we uh, because like most of the things are automated, we cannot kind of like make a forecast and make the vault make and make a decision to kind of like deposit before the week ends. So currently, I think maybe in B twos we could kind of like integrate something like that and see. Okay, so these are the uh, the op uh, public funding program is going on those are the dates where it would go on and then the wall directs like a bulk of the uh, volume on, on those strategies but currently it it's like completely automated so we wait for the week we see what the changes are and also one of the reasons to not do it too quickly is that the increase in aprs right so the increase in aprs is not so significant because mm-hmm. all you are losing is let's say 3 days of heat and if it's like the increase is like let's say it's a, it goes from 7 to uh, 14% out of that 7% the yield for those 3 days is like very low and we are going to give a bit of that in the fees of like switching before before the weekend right so so i think like it, it the best the best way to do it is just like wait for the week and because there is no significant loss and also the fees is then socialized across so so it becomes i think uh, best to do it like at the end of the week but maybe in b2 yeah yeah i suppose if someone was so aggressive to want to chase and hunt yield they'd probably be doing it manually anyway but um Mm -hmm. so is is there any kind of you guys i know this might be trying to give a little bit too much away at this point but is there any kind of thoughts on your end of you know if it was through curve to try and boost emissions by acquiring you know, larger stake weight or, you know, how you've seen like specific yield aggregators that are bespoke to kind of one product, go and acquire a lot of the underlying projects native token to then kind of being able to boost yield across the board for all their users. Do you think that that's a good method of doing it? Do you think you give too much away with your own emissions from your own native token if you do it that kind of way? Because I've seen a few, like obviously Convex did it well with Curve, Vertex did it with Trader Joe and like Platypus, I believe. And there was a few of us that, you know, if they could acquire a specific amount of tokens for the underlying where you're going to direct yield to, then they could obviously boost rewards for everyone um, that was using the platform. Or are you guys just going to be kind of yield aggregator? This is what it is. We're going to kind of just use the tech as opposed to kind of trying to heavily incentivize and 
run into issues five down the line. So uh, I personally think it's a it's a great way to utilize in some protocols and not all, right? So so when we take an example of curve and we take an example of like balancer. uh with what we can do with aura right uh, so mm-hmm. with curve and balancer the great thing is that the tvls are like really really high so even if you're getting let's say 5% and and the pool has like some 200 million dollars in liquidity adding 5 million dollars is like better to do it on that pool right because it won't kill the apr because it's already a pretty large pool and uh, so that way in those protocols i think it makes sense for us to acquire those tokens now the methods are like pretty different on like how others are using it and how we might use it but our current uh, the current way we are thinking uh, regarding this is that when we are using curve pools and we, when we are using balancer pool we take a portion of the profit to uh, portion of the profit that we don't convert to usdc or the stable coin so let's say uh, let's say the underlying vault is like usdc vault right and we are uh, we are getting like crv in emissions so we'll take So, so generally, for all the protocols, it's like we take those CRV and convert it to stable coin and re-deposit into into the vault. So, with, mm-hmm. with in the case specific to curve and balancer, we'll take some part of it and not uh, not re-deposit, and we'll just like buy those lock tokens to kind of like uh, uh, get uh, boosted rewards and and things like that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That's a good way of doing it as well because I think. It's, I think it's great in the early days when projects will incentivize definitely to kind of use it as a customer acquisition cost and a customer acquisition channel. But I think when they try and onboard too many projects that they want to try and absorb their tokens from, particularly if they're using it by, you know, paying out emissions to get people to lock their own tokens, I think, you know, I don't think that model's worked very, very well. I think there's only a handful of projects that have managed to pull it, pull that off. So um, that's that's an interesting way of doing it using like purely profits from the protocol, which is nice to see. Yeah, exactly. Because that way, I think it's it's much more organic to kind of like get get those mm-hmm. like CRV tokens, and and also we don't kind of like lock lock the users out of their own principal or things like like that, right? Yeah, I suppose that runs into another issue of then having to defend some kind of derivative peg as well. Mm-hmm. And then you've got also got that headache to worry about. <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, like it, it, it. I won't name the protocol, but it happened with like with uh, a few of them, which were kind of like it was also an arbitrum, and then then. <laughs> I, then... I know you're about. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know if they were that the liquidity is actually gone live for that. Is it? Yeah. Yeah, man. So the airdrop was completely gone. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Some people didn't read the fine print, right? And I was also one of them. I didn't know like how exactly it's going to work, but but yeah, I guess like it was mistake on my can't blame protocol. <laughs> yeah, I used it to come to claim, and then it prompted me to claim and convert, and I was like, nah, I'm just claiming. <laughs> 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 um. So, how? We've spoke a little bit about strategies. How do you guys think about them? How are they decided initially? What does it look like from the get-go, and what does it look like into the near future? Like, have you got kind of a vision of how strategies will be deployed? Um, I'd love to pick, pick your brain on that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that uh, actually we are using uh, using uh, our own way of kind of like uh, giving them some ratings regarding like what risk do they have, and then we see how it is going to fit. in our like uh, junior vault or senior vault or is it not going to fit at all so we obviously look at the tvl and and the age of the protocol itself and is it upgradable and things like that so we are like very strict with what we do on the senior vault side of things with junior vaults those things are like uh, a little bit lenient right so we are a little bit lenient on those things so also on top of that what we are going to do is so i think it is also mentioned in our documentation that uh, Uh, so there are two uh, two other um, uh, kind of like protocols or products that that rate DeFi pools. Right? So one is exponential DeFi. They give the ratings, and and I think the ratings part is completely uh, they're going to open source it, and I think they did all right, right. And then there is DeFi safety. So that way we can kind of like scan through the pools, see okay, so on optimism these are the new pools that came in, see what are the risks associated with them, and then start writing strategies for them. Because I think without that. um in the end like the, the the first thing to do is like save users assets from potential rugs or maybe like exploits from new protocol that is happening and that way it doesn't just affect the reputation of that 
protocol where we are writing strategy for it also affects us in a way right because we wrote yeah. that strategy and then we integrated into the vault and the aprs were really good so the vault decided to deploy there so so i think we had have to be a bit strict there and i think exponential defi and defi safety are like two places where you could look into what pools are kind of good enough to to sustain like how much liquidity we can provide there so so yeah as i said right we are very conservative with the senior vaults and we are a bit lenient on the junior vaults and we use a mix of our own like uh, method to give them some rating and we also use uh, exponential defi and defi safety um how much of a how much heavy lifting is it to to deploy a new strategy like if the pro, like like let's say like the Unison you know, protocols fully audited. Does every, every single strategy need to go through its own line of auditing, or is is there any kind of stop gaps there? Um, one to protect users' funds, but two to make it as easy for you guys to deploy without having kind of hurdles and road and roadblocks with kind of waiting around for auditors and things like that. Or does how does that aspect of it work? So uh, that part, I think, like with yield aggregation, that is one part where where, where things kind of get slowed down a bit, right? So with newer mm-hmm. protocols, we have to go with edit, uh, like audits, right? So so it depends on like what the protocol exactly is. So any new strategy that we write on a protocol which is which has no kind of like similar forks on other chains, it has to go to the audits and we have to wait for it. Now it also depends on in certain scenarios. So let's say we are writing strategy for for curve. And it is audited uh, already, right? So, curve pools are almost uh, like like the smart contract side of things looks completely same, right? So, so for curve we don't have to. So, let's say a new pool comes in on curve, we can go it uh, go and deploy that strategy uh, with much more confident than let's say a newer protocol coming in popping in on another chain. So, it it I think uh, that is one thing that obviously slows like ill aggregators down. But uh, but we have got some uh, like retention agreements and 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 obviously the auditors also understand that this is the problem yeah. statement we can't so 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 the, the problem there is that uh, if the audit is going to take two weeks the the, the opportunity is gone so we have to work <laughs> with partners that can do the audits uh, pretty great and also some partners that again like I won't name but uh, not uh, so it depends right who are you uh, going yeah, for yeah. audits uh, to. <laughs> So, uh, so, so that's that's our strategy, right? So, so with protocols where we have already written strategies, we are just changing a pool. We we won't need an audit because it's the same smart contract. But newer protocols, I think, has to go through the process. But yeah, I think our partners understand that part, and we can do it much quicker. Yeah, for sure. Um, so what? I think you mentioned like kind of opening the vaults and strategies up. What what's what does that look like? Does it make it? Where a user could suggest or suggest a vault. This is how it works. This is the potential earnings on it. This is how long it's going to take to deploy. Do they would they look to then get like a small commission off the back of that? Like, um, how how's how do you think that might work? So I think like Yearn has done a great job there, right? So opening it for from strategist and like basically uh, sharing whatever the performance fee of the strategy is to to the people who kind of like. Uh, writes those, those strategies right? so the process is going to be the same right same as how we do it and it is going to be the same for strategies they can suggest their strategy then it goes through through our process of like the audits and we see like how the protocol is and see where it is going to fit in our vaults and then that user could uh, potentially earn a percent of whatever the performance fee we are charging so it, it, it is going to be like pretty simple and even the context that we have made right so the, the whole architecture is like pretty modular and and that was like by design because we wanted something which could be used to uh, to kind of like make composability m- more easier. So let's say a guy comes up with a curve strategy. He already has a factory smart contract that he can use, and then suggest it in in our governance and, and uh, kind of like we integrate it after the due diligence system. So so I yeah. think the uh, the the year and finance model is pretty great there, and we are going to follow the the similar uh, thing there when once we open. It to strategies. Okay, um, what what baskets of users do you think are gonna be all over this? Like, obviously, for me personally, it's it'd be such a simple and you know remove a lot of hassle from what I do manually anyway. So, like the end user, just like your average retail investor, is definitely gonna use it. But are there are any other like baskets of users that you think might come in and like pick it up and run with it. 
Mm-hmm. So I think like now it's a good time to talk about uh, what we are going to offer to DAOs, and we already have like a couple of DAOs that has uh, committed to use our use our product. I I will be naming them I guess soon, but uh, once we once we go close to the public uh, public launch, so so one is obviously our public vaults, the senior and junior vaults are uh, targeted towards the retail and people who want to earn the yield in DeFi without without doing the manual work of like bridging and all sorts of thing. The second uh, so. when you we were building the cross chain aggregation part we we found out that the architecture works really great for uh, for managing doubt histories also right in in a way to kind of like do it efficiently so the way it looks for doubts is you can come on unison platform you can create a vault which is self custodial that the the controller of that vault is the dao treasury manager himself right so you create a vault you choose the strategies that unison has written or you write your own strategy you choose the allocation and then the vault is created and your money is uh, put on queues and i think it's like a really huge huge uh, uh sorry so i think it's it's like a really uh, huge market in that sense uh, i think the data from like just like 3 or 4 months back right so there are 13 billion dollars worth of assets that are sitting idle on doubt registries because there is no a uh, product which kind of like solves it perfectly for DAOs and we talk to a lot of DAOs and treasury managers also so for the DAOs as i said right the the, the uh, so one thing is that it is mainly for DAO use uh, DAO treasury managers who lack the technical expertise to kind of write their own strategies so so i guess like the newer newer DAOs and newer protocols that are launching right they won't have a team member looking into strategies they want it to kind of like do it as easily as we 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 do it without without writing solidity or knowing solidity right so so once once they do that what they have is a risk adjusted vault right so let's say they are just happy with deploying their assets to aave and curve they can do so with whatever allocation they use so these are like personalized vaults that those users can use now coming to the main point right and i think this is one of the unique selling points of like what we are doing at unison when we were talking to daos and when we were talking to fund managers who who manage large amounts of uh, assets on 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 chain right completely on chain one of the major problem was the avenues to kind of like hedge your exposure to protocols right so we've got nexus mutual in the insurance part and then we've got the shellock defi protocol uh, shellock auditing firm right they also provide some kind of insurance so so that was the the major issue that that these guys were facing it was that how do we kind of like put assets on your protocol and then also kind of uh, hedge our risk to to let's say a strategy a a, a, pro, a strategy that we have writ, uh, written for a protocol going down right so and that's where we found out that the daos were much more willing to use protocols which are like passive asset managers something like earn finance because you could use the vault tokens to then take a loan on a money market on a lending market right so that way uh, so that's that's the first thing that we did too right so we made a partner who is going to take unison's vault tokens and offer them as a collateral and then you can take loan but i think that's not the most efficient way to do it right the maximum that you can uh, the maximum that uh, uh, you can cover is like 80 to 85% or whatever maximum ltv is going to be and also the cost is pretty high now if you take like nexus mutual for example the cost is like 1.24% for curve right and if we take shellock for example the the cost is like 3% per year to to cover 2% uh, to cover like two i think the maximum they offer is like 2 or 3 million dollars so mm-hmm. we talked to them and then we found out this is a huge problem and then we looked into derivatives i think that's the best way to do insurance right now now there are obviously some cons uh, but i'll 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 give you an a background on how it works on unison so as a dao right you can create your own vault and then you know that these are the strategies that i've put my money in but i want to insure those strategies so maybe some protocol might get hacked so we provide a very simple single button which which says like buy cover and we send a request so it's an rfq system the request goes to uh, an auction underwriter right and then you get like multiple uh, uh, multiple codes for for let's say you want to uh, you want to insure one million dollars and and this is the protocol that you want to insure for uh, so you you get a list of like all 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 the rates that you're going to get right and that way you can buy cover and it works uh, in a very simple way what we do is we we buy american style uh, digital options with a fixed payout 
at multiple strike prices and we uh, rotate it like so and we buy it weekly right so the user gets like a, a good average rate and that way he can ensure the money in a strategy and the rates are like insanely low so so uh, we ran numbers for like defi blue chip protocols like uh, curve and and uh, euler uh, before before it was hacked uh, so the rates were like 0.24% a year compared to nexus mutual it was offering 1.1.3% 1. 1. as i said right and yeah. with uh, uh, and with like shellog it's 3% so it's like significantly reduced and and it's a free market so we onboard option underwriters and you get like multiple courses and you can choose what you want to do you can choose if you want to do like just 50% of the cover right and the reason to make the cost low right so the reason to look into derivatives was obviously the cost is pretty low and we as a yield protocol if we are paying 3% and the yield that we are generating is just 4% it doesn't make sense for them to deploy that right? because because in the end you are not getting anything so yeah so uh, i think like i i uh segwayed a lot from the question but uh but yeah so defi native users retail we've got public vaults for them and for daos we've got this whole system of creating their own vault and buy insurance on top of it uh, on a strategy specific manner yeah that's sick. i love i love the idea of opening up the market to people being able to underwrite the uh the specific vault why i don't know why that hasn't been done properly <laughs> before it kind of as soon as you explained it it was like oh my god yeah that's how you do it <laughs> i think that the, the the huge problem is mainly like uh, options on 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 chain options hasn't taken off as much as we'd want to right so so mm-hmm. still now like options i think are traded mainly on on centralized exchanges like deribit and all and i think that is one one of the core issues right so so with with things like uh, the things like ropex and all obviously you can do the same thing with that right but the liquidity is like very low and then if the liquidity yeah. is very low for those uh, for those options you have to pay a much higher price right because the price is uh, like like you can't buy a cover of 2 million dollars with the same rates that i'm seeing on on something like ropex or evo right so so i think like uh, our our strategy there is to onboard option underwriters from the traditional finance world and also big option underwriters and then have an on chain process where you could request for quotes to them and they give you and this whole thing the trade settles in it's a cash settle trade right so so the, the the money you get back when something bad happens is in usdc or usdt whatever the user chooses so i think it's it's uh, this is this is something that we are very very bullish on in inside us right i think that's one place but i think it, there's a need in the market to kind of like everybody loves great yield great aprs but then the, the risks are like insane and if you can kind of like insure those things i think it it's it's pretty good yeah i think you're coming into that at a really really good time as well because you're definitely starting to see some a lot of maturity in the particularly even in the on chain options space i know evo and lyra have got some big things coming up as well so that's i think you're hitting that just like the nail on the head there with regards to kind of timing it to perfection but um yeah i, I don't know what it is about options in defi and crypto it's like as soon as you say the word options everyone's like runs away as if it's like this big scary difficult complex thing and i know there are aspects of it that just even still go over my head to this day but um you know like if you dumb it down to its simplest level i know you've got y2k on your on the landing page of your site that's like a dual sided exactly. dual outcome market it's like one side's in the right in the risk of a depot it's you know i think those guys dolled it up really really well to make it accessible for a lot of people and probably even abstracted the fact of where that they were actually trading options <laughs> <laughs> no yeah exactly i think like that's that's the way to go that you so even ours uh, we do it using derivatives right but but the interface and everything looks so simple that you don't know that you are buying put options like far out of the money put options that's the way that's the way that's right? that's the way yeah so um what what is the connection with Y2K? Are they just going to be a kind of partner protocol? Is there any is there any integration there? I mean, as much or as little detail as you want to go into, I don't want people spilling any <laughs> too much alpha. Although we, the guests would love it. <laughs> uh, so Y2K guys uh, are great. I think we 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 partnered with them like a few months ago, and we are writing strategies on Y2K, and we are also uh, so uh, so I had a. a few i think i had two calls with carnation and she's like really really smart in terms of like what we can do with y2k even we didn't kind of uh, kind of like uh, 
understand like all all the ways we could kind of like utilize it so so we are writing strategies there and we are also going to use their uh, uh the the peg vaults right the risk vaults and the hedge vaults um uh, because one of the strategies basically buying both risk and hedge vault and collecting the premium right which is like mm-hmm. pretty pretty solid way to earn yield and and as it's like cash settled like stable coin settled uh, sorry eth settled i uh, guess i might be wrong but eth or or stable coin yeah, so that's like ETH that's real yeah. yeah so so it's it's uh, it gives like the users real yield right so so yeah so the partnership right now is basically utilizing those vaults and and some more to kind of like write strategies using white to get when when are people going to be able to give this a whirl like when what when, when can you, we expect to get our hands on it uh so so we did release our our um, very simple mvp kind of beta to the community where they could try out like how it is going to look but it's like very very simple so uh, i can give access to anybody who wants to try it but i think we are going to close it soon and now the next stage is basically doing a public launch which we are focused on and i think like we uh <clears throat> there's a chance uh, i think like the eta currently looks like uh, end of august or first september right we are working on a few things right. because we want to release with like insurance in short part also at least on the test net the insurance part so end of august maybe september where you could kind of like try try your hands on how exactly the protocol is working right and initially we are going to release with like five volts eth and some stables and we have written strategies for that and i think the aprs are like pretty good right on senior vaults which are like getting the least risk we are seeing double digit aprs we are seeing like 10 11% there on junior vaults we are seeing like 20 to 25% on stables and without any liquidity mining rewards or nothing like that right so uh from unison i mean yeah yeah that's sweet really good um is the you know like costs for the protocol to route it to a specific chain and like any compounding is that like baked into the end users apr yeah yeah so the all the aprs that you see is uh, after after the piece is taken care of the performance fee is taken care of and everything else right so what you get is like if it's 11% percent, you'll get 11% percent. and that's yeah. it all right nice um so initially it's gonna it, don't give too much away but <laughs> initially uh strategy is going to be deployed on just like one or two chains handful of chains is there anything you can give us an inkling towards that mm-hmm. uh so i think like optimism and arbitrum has pretty great deals so yes we are going to start with that and also it's like uh <coughs> sorry also i think it's 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 uh, very easy to onboard users as because the communities are pretty huge right so so we are going to start with like optimism and arbitrum and then we are going to expand and i think we are going, uh, the tests that we have done and the strategies that we have written we have written for avalanche phantom and and like a couple of other chains too so so integrating them is just basically integrating the strategy to the vault itself right so so every work is done in that way but we are going to do it in a phased manner right where we start with the the, the bigger places where we are writing strategies that is like arbitrum optimism and then we kind of like expand into obviously like base ha- is pretty interesting i think also yeah. pretty high but so <laughs> we are going to <laughs> so we are going to go there like pretty soon and we are also uh, partners with para chain so that's also one thing that oh, nice. i'm a bit excited about so yeah yeah i was going to say i mean you just got to think i think as i said at the beginning of the podcast i think we're at the very very early stages despite kind of lazy rubbing on the tip of everyone's tongue mainly for a lot of people wanting an airdrop <laughs> but i think i think it's certainly been used to a great degree but i i just really don't think we've even seen the beginning of like the hockey stick growth potential of what could actually be done using that that messaging layer um and i love to see like the likes of yourselves and the tapioca guys and just exploring what's actually possible over there and you know it's something i've as soon as i seen lazy will come out and the white paper and everything i was like yeah this is going to be huge it just feels like it's it's slowly getting into that phase where people are starting to pay real attention to who's building on it as opposed to trying to sibyl it to death for an <laughs> for an airdrop so <laughs> um no, i'm i'm super impressed i can't wait to give it a go and if anyone's listening i'll, I'll leave all the 
proper links in the description and things like that before. But where does where do you guys reside? Are you in Telegram, Discord? Where where would you like people to try and find you? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So so as you said, right. So just like continuing that, I think like uh, the, the the layer zero and all like the cross chain general messaging thing is going to be huge, right? Because it solves a lot of things in terms of the UX, right? You you can't be switching networks when you want to kind of like no. use the D apps, and it's it's like the UX kind of sucks right now, right? With so so I think like that is going to be huge with layer zero, right? Consumer apps I think can do a lot, right? We are going to release a Unison SDK which will allow users to kind of uh, integrate our walls on on a web two app or any any kind of app right that they can kind of nice. like do it as simple as possible i think that's far far in the picture but but that's that's our goal right so that sdk can be used anywhere and then you won't know which chain you're on and you're just using blockchain without even knowing right so i think like that's uh that's one of the the things that we are also personally bullish on right abstracting away most of the things which which makes blockchain scary for for a normal user and then what you get is like a very seamless experience also, what Optimism is doing with their super chain uh, thing, right? Once, once, I think like once it's it's uh, the roadmap is completed, what they think that super chain has to be, I think also that is going to improve the UX a lot. And I and we personally, obviously, we are biased, but we want to be the first there to be like a, a super chain app, right? So no switching of networks, no bridging also required, right? And asset is native on all three, four chains that super, that are part of the super chain thing. So I think that's going to be great. But yeah, so on Twitter, uh, coming to that part, so you can follow us on Twitter on unison underscore GG, right? So we don't have a Telegram. Uh, on Discord, it's uh, to join our Discord, it's discord.gg uh, slash unison. And yeah, I, I'll also uh, uh, I'll also DM, I think like you, you already uh, follow me on Twitter, but I'll also DM you here. Uh, so that's my Twitter. And yeah, perfect. What's that's that's great. What's what's funny about what you've just said about the optimism of super chain? Right back at the beginning, you guys were talking about loving the idea of Cosmos because of all the interoperability and all the applications and all the app chains getting built on it. But now it feels like it's just fell so perfectly into place that it's came completely full circle, and it looks like yeah. optimism are going to actually pull that off. In their own little way, oh. anyway. So, <laughs> so it's kind of a full <laughs> circle. And you guys, you guys have set out to build one thing, deferred to somewhere else, and then the things actually chased you guys around. And <laughs> just a, <laughs> a nice, nice little story to wrap it all up. There. Oh yeah, I mean, I think, I think, yeah, it's perfect. I never thought like that, but yeah, I think, yeah, with Cosmos, <laughs> I think that our, our, our idea was exactly that, right? That it's so seamless that the users won't know. But yeah, I guess optimism. Optimism peeps are great for sure. <laughs> man, you just got to think. Imagine if there's, um, particularly on the Coinbase wallet app, I can imagine they're going to whitelist or white label a load of applications that make it super simple to onboard people into DeFi. And like something like this, where you guys are really focusing on abstracting away any of the complexities and any of like the manual yield farming and yield ag- aggregation. Um, you need to give give big bald Brian a call and say, look, look what we're building. We need to be, we need, we need to be white labeled to be on the app because it, it just feels like it's both are trying to, you know, help on board the next, however many users and abstract away any of the complexities. And it feels like a really nice little fit there. So yeah, you need to get, get him on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I mean like, yeah, I mean like that's, that's the whole, uh, whole thing, right? With, with wallets, the distribution becomes like so easy. That, that you already have the users of the wallet itself. And then you, if you are like white labeled, you've got like bulk of your TVL coming from there. And and uh, Coinbase wallet specifically is like really, really good to use, right? So so in terms of like what they what they offer and how easy it is for like even a new user to understand. So yeah, I guess we'll talk with Brian. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you let me know what he says. Um, but thanks, thanks so much for joining. And again, apologies for how long it's take, took to jump on, but... Um, yeah, and if there's anything you need from us, you know you know where we are. We're always happy. And once you guys go live, if you want to kind of jump back on and give us a bit of a demo and things like that, we're always happy to do that. But yeah, once again, really appreciate your time. Yeah, man, thanks. Thanks for taking. I'm like, was really excited to come here. And and thanks for taking the time out to, to host us. And yeah, I'll let you know anything we need. All right. Perfect. All right, thanks a lot, everyone. If you want any of the links, they're all in the description. And yeah, be... 
back Tuesdays and Fridays for usual catch up. Good morning, DJ, and Tuesday, Thursdays. Um, if you haven't subscribed yet, what are you playing at? Um, <laughs> but yeah, speak to you next time. Thanks a lot. 